If you were asked to name the most bizarre Roman emperor, you might hear the names of Nero and Caligula, but they'd be wrong. Nero, go fiddle with yourself, mate. Caligula, a simple seashell collecting sex addict. Try saying that five times fast. No, the real bizarre one has to be Elagalabus, at least if you listen to the ancient historians. Honestly, the written accounts on him are truly astounding. Cassius Dio, Herodian and the Historia Augusta do a fantastic job of slandering him. A very quick disclaimer before we start, these historians use Elagalaba sleeping with men, acting effeminate and, at one point, wanting to be a trans woman as insults. These stand contrary to my views on the subject, but it's important for context that they get reported on, as they were traditional, though awful, Roman ways of indicating who they feel is a bad emperor. Now, it's time for some bad history. After Macrinus had off the Severan Emperor, Carcalla, and managed to get himself appointed Emperor, despite having zero claim other than, the army wants me to be, he made the same mistake so many other emperors had done before. You are now the Emperor, and your loyal troops await their rewards. What shall I tell them? Um, this is a bit awkward, really, but tell them that things are a bit tight at the moment, what with the war in the East and all. Uh, we're going to have to cut their pay. I'm sure they'll understand. Yes, I'm sure they will. Check to see who we have next on the Make Emperor list. That's it. I give up. We have no one. I've been thinking. Go on. If we choose just anyone, then it would be the right person, no matter what, right? Why? Because the gods won't just let anyone become emperor, so they would have to have intervened and chosen the right one. Did you just invent divine right of kings? I think I did. In which case, I picked that boy who's twerking like a bad S Club 7 tribute act over there. He's as good as any. That twerking boy was in fact Elagabalus, who they'd found literally dancing around in the provincial backwater of Syria, though the twerking was supposed to be a religious dance. His real name was Varius Antonius, a name given, it is said, because his mother slept with enough people for him to have various fathers. There were some claims made about him being the bastard son of the Roman Emperor Carcalla, but that was probably scheming by his powerful and rich grandmother, Julia Mesa. He certainly had noble lineage, though. What with his grandmother being the exiled sister-in-law of Carcalla, Macrinus had exiled Julia when he had become emperor, rather than killed her. Yet another rookie mistake by the emperor, who didn't even manage to make it to Rome. Upon being thrust into pretender emperor status, he set about hunting down the current emperor. They found him, and battle lines were drawn. However, Today we stand, fight, and die for the one true emperor. My grandmother will pay you lots of money to fight for us. Oh, all right then. Oh, bugger. So far, so standard Roman Emperor. But things were about to get a little more silly. As well as being a sign of the Severan dynasty, Elagalabus was also the head priest of the otherwise obscure Syrian god, also called Elagalabus. It's how the Emperor got his nickname, but we'll call the god by another of its names, Heliogabalus from now on, to make things easier to differentiate. Heliogabalus was a sun god, most notable for being a rock. Okay, not really, but they used a rock they said was sent down by Zeus as their sacred object, and worshipped it. So, god rock it is. They set off for Rome, but little Elagabalus got off to a bad start when... What is that hideous thing? It's the traditional emperor clothing, sir. May the god rock strike you down with pebbles. I only wear silk robes, and I'll need a crown, and a tiara. Silk robes were, to Romanize, something of a foreign dress sense, and a crown and tiara were definitely big no-nos. For all the Romans now had emperors, they at least paid lip service to not having a king. To get them used to this, Elagabala sent a painting of him dressed as such ahead of him, to be hung in the Senate above the Statue of Victory, so that the senators had to both see him and make offerings to him when they did so to the goddess. Awkward, but manageable. But that was just a start. As soon as Elagabalus arrived, he ordered a temple to be built for Heliogalabus, and that all religious relics, from all gods, be housed there, which pissed the devout right off. But the sources were even more damning as to what happened in the temple. Such minor things as orgies, castration, human sacrifice, using the bodies of sacrificed children for divination, you name it, it was claimed he did it. So pretty much the same thing that the QAnon lot think that Hillary Clinton gets up to in her spare time. Q must have been taking notes in history class. You'd think all that would keep him busy, but... No. He had an empire to run. Or not. Pretty much all the sources agree that the empire was essentially run by a combination of his grandmother, his mother, and some men who Elagalabas had appointed on the most logical of qualifications. Specifically, the size of their manhood. Are you well qualified? I had run the treasury for the last three emperors. I have decades of experience and... Take your toga and loincloth off. Uh, my what? Did I stutter? It's just too much of a prude. Next. Your qualifications are most impressive. 
You're hired. No, seriously, they claim we would have spies in various bathhouses throughout Rome report back on particularly endowed men, and have those men brought to him to sleep with, and would then appoint them to various positions of power. He'd even get them to reveal their, um, qualifications in public, so he could bend down and kiss them there. He also, supposedly, took great pleasure in shaving those same regions. So he spent his time doing awful religious stuff, and having his way with men of large qualifications. No, well... Yes, but much more. Early on, he sensibly got married to a noble woman, but that was too sensible for our Ella Glabus. Who is that? She's a vestal virgin. She's gorgeous. She's sworn to religious chastity. Challenge accepted. If you sleep with her, then she'll be burned to death. Our children will be demigods. He quickly divorces Cornelia, then sleeps with and marries the Vestal Virgin. He then divorces her because what's the point in just one marriage scandal involving a Vestal Virgin? Then marries a noblewoman, Anna Aurelia Faustina, of the family of Marcus Aurelius. Yes, he of Gladiator and being conned by Alexander of Abonaticus, fame. Oh, and something to do with him being a good emperor? But who cares about that? Then he divorces her to get back with the Vestal Virgin. So basically, he acted like almost any teenage boy with unlimited power would do, or the average university halls of residence. Speaking of halls of residence, he supposedly had a brothel built at his home so that he could prostitute himself. Even Roman emperors had to have a side hustle, and Uber hadn't been invented yet. Whilst all this was going on, he decides he needs to play matchmaker to the god rock, who he had just elevated to being more important than Jupiter, pissing the religious right off even more than Alexandria Cortez manages to do these days. You know, I've been thinking. Oh, gods. I keep getting married, but who has my poor rock god, I mean Heliogalabus, got? All of creation? No, I mean special someone that he can have sweet pillow talk with, tie up and forget safety words with, and let's cut him off there. So he marries Helio Gabalasov to Pallas. Only he doesn't, because apparently the god rock doesn't fancy her armour or something. Who knew rocks could be quite so picky? So he instead send for the statue of the goddess Urania from Carthage to marry the god rock to. He also demands a load of gold as a dowry, which I find to be a nice touch, because why piss off the believers of one pantheon of gods? when you can shoot for two. Is that everything? In the words of Churchill, the dog, not the Prime Minister. Oh, no, 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 no. There's talk about the sport that almost brought down the Byzantine Roman Empire, chariot racing. Ella Galabas was a fan. He would attend races and hand out lucky dip prizes to the audience. You win a warehouse full of gold. You win a dead dog. You win a year's supply of meat. You win ten live bears. He wasn't so much a fan of the racing, it's claimed, as those doing the racing. He would flirt with, and later send for, the various male charities he found attractive, taking one of them as his long-term lover, and wishing to become his bride. To the point that Ella Galabas wanted to turn his own manhood inside out, and become a woman. Using trans as an insult has been going strong for 2,000 years, unfortunately. He would also ride chariots himself, using lions to pull him, or stags, or naked women. Of course, not just any chariot would do. He had to have his made of gold and jewels. On one occasion, he even put the god rock in it, driverless, and walked in front of it, backwards, worshipping the god rock the whole way. How did he know which way to go? By strewing gold dust as a path. He literally had the streets made of gold. Lucky they'd already conquered the Spanish by then. So how does one recover from such excesses? With carefully constructed meals. Of course, this is Ella Galabas, so nothing is quite that simple. On occasion, he would invite his guests people on a particular theme. Who shall we invite as our dinner guest tonight, sir? Oh, uh, the usual crowd. Very good, sir. Oh, and, um, maybe eight one-eyed people? Eight what? Oh, and eight bald people tomorrow, and then eight super fat people the day after. He did this mostly so he and his regular guests could laugh at them. Remember, he was still of an age that he would be in school these days, and he hadn't had anyone capable of saying no to him in years. The food itself? Often bizarre. How do you fancy 1,000 weasels? Or 6,000 ostrich brains? How about mixing jewels and food together, making you eat pearl necklace bolognese? Or how about no food, just rocks and wax imitations that you still had to eat anyway? Not sure how the god rock felt about you eating its children, though. It's a sun god. But if the food was bizarre, there were worse options. He was in the habit of locking drunk friends who had gone to bed in with a lion or a bear. Defanged and declawed, not that they would know it. So they would wake up, scream, and discover they couldn't escape. If waking up in a strange room with no memory of the night before and an awful hangover wasn't bad enough, now imagine the same, but with a live bear towering over you. That morning after seen from train spotting would have nothing on my reaction. Others who were tied to a water wheel slowly turning them in and out of water as other guests ate. 
More than a few drowned that way. You'll notice any mention of war is missing from the account so far, and that's because he had zero interest. He did like a good show and a good booze up where the wine flowed like rivers, which is why he filled canals full of wine and had ships perform mock naval battles on them. Imagine the smell for months after that happening. I hate the smell from cleaning up the morning after a house party or Cardiff after a Welsh rugby match. This would be on a whole new level. Of course, the Empire doesn't function on orgies, wine filled canals, and bizarre food. It needed ruling. His grandmother did what she could, but she soon saw that Elagalabus would need replacing, but in a way that kept her in power. So she convinced him to adopt and put his 12 year old cousin Alexander, her other grandson, as a Caesar to his Augustus. This he would quickly rue as the army fell swiftly in line behind the much more sensible boy Alexander. The soldiers love him and not me. Why? Because he wants glory, doesn't worship a rock, and doesn't try to feed them stones? I don't follow. Anyway, I unadopt him. You can't just unadopt him, sir. The Senate won't allow it. They will have to do what I say. I am the Emperor. After failing to get his adoption cancelled, he spread a rumour that Alexander was gravely ill. Predictably, the army wasn't happy about that, and made some threatening noises. What? Oh, was that my cue? Sorry, sorry. Uh, grrr. So he quickly produced an alive and well Alexander at an army camp. The soldiers cheered, which pissed Elagalabus right off. When he got home, he ordered the death of all those that cheered, which was the straw that broke the camel's back. The soldiers hunted for him, and when they found him hiding in a latrine, they killed him, then dragged his body around for all to see, before disposing of him like they would a, well, latrine. And so, after four bizarre years, we'd reached the end of the narrative the ancient historians gave him. Is it true? Almost certainly not. There are elements of it that ring true from what we can ascertain, but only small parts. The book, The Crimes of El Agalabas, is a fantastic book that lays out why his reign was probably nowhere near as bizarre as it was made out to be. And though there are snippets of truth in the accounts, most claims are probably just propaganda. Proper historians always try to spoil the fun. In the last video, we looked at Alexander of Abonotychus, and I warned of the danger of having to rely on only one source. But having multiple sources does not guarantee good history, and Ella Galabas is a wonderful example of this. So this video was designed to be bad history, to take those ancient historians at their word, so that we can see just how far such people were willing to go. But what it is, is a wonderful case study of how these historians would slander the name of the unpopular emperors of the time, whether to curry favour with the present regime, to lift their prestige, or simply because they didn't know any better and so believed the stories. They tell us more about the time period than they actually tell us about Ella Galabas. There's far more stories about Ella Galabas than I was able to cover here and keep it to a reasonable length, from setting snakes and scorpions loose on the public to demanding a slave fetch him £10,000 worth of spiderwebs, and much, much more. I strongly suggest you read the free translations that have been linked in the video description below. For a more balanced read, I again recommend the book The Crimes of Ella Galabas, linked to which is also in the video description below. In the meantime, thanks for watching. Like if you liked, subscribe if you haven't, and if silly ancient Romans are your thing, check out the last video on Alexander of Abonotychus. He have invented a god that's made out of socks.